Let's start with Pioneer. How did the project start? How did you get attracted to the, the subjects? It, on my behalf, it started when the producer and the initial uh, screenwriters approached me. This is six years ago, I think. Mm. Um, they didn't have a story, they had the subject matter, which was the pioneer divers in, in the late 70s uh, who were trying to sort of uh, cross a threshold in how deep you can actually work underwater. And it's an interesting name, Pioneer, like that they use that as well. Like, were you punning with that at all? Like the kind of what that means to be a pioneer, like kind of the, the negative yeah, no. ramifications? Yeah, I think Pioneer was, was attached to it before me, but I really like that title. It, it sort of, it, 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 ha it can have various connotations, you know, yeah. like sort of, uh, and there's always an inherent danger in being the first, you know, whatever you do. It, and, and this is uh, following Nokas, they're both two very historically rooted uh, films that are depicting something that's actually happened. Are you becoming more attracted to that kind of story? Actually, I think most of my work has been on the threshold between yeah. fiction and facts. Uh, and it's part of my interest is, is that a, a film should somehow connect mm. to the world we live in, somewhat. Uh, uh, I kind of like genre movies, and I like playing with them. I like, mm. but 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 it's not enough in it in of itself. You know, I, I, I kind of uh, um, I, I feel like it it, it should have uh, uh, it should be rooted somewhere. And then the level of fictionalization, how much you you fictionalize, mm. uh, is something I'm kind of. Uh, open to to approach differently uh, at, in, in different projects. Mm. And you mentioned genre in this one, was it kind of like the 70s conspiracy story? Like it seemed like that was maybe the visual uh, inspiration? Yeah, see I grew up in the 70s and, and, and these conspiracy thrillers, especially the American ones, uh, inspired me a lot. So they were kind of um, part of my the aesthetic foundation of, 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 of what, what I wanted to achieve in, with film when I later started making films. And, uh, and this was a perfect opportunity in many ways, and part of the reason which I was drawn to the project. Mm. It was the one in particular, I, I was thinking of, I just saw it, but I was thinking of Parallax View, I guess a lot, a lot of the zooms that were happening and the wide open spaces, like the uh, framing it so there's like a big empty space and like just two characters no, not particularly Parallax View. I, I, I was very, I remember at the time, I, I never went back and looked at the mm. movies because I, that's not quite how I work. I sort of trust that it's somewhere in here anyway. Uh, but, uh, but I was very inspired at the time by the conversation oh, yeah. by Coppola. And also there's something about all the precedent men which I found very uh, intriguing. It, it's like a story I som you somehow know uh, but it was, but it, but it still felt very. Um, it felt very, kind of exciting to watch something you knew, which was historically correct, and at the same time, it was. A, it, it sort of ended midway through the the, the actual event. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, and uh, that that film in particular, I thought there's something about it which I uh, felt was inspiring. Mm. One shot that keeps sticking in my mind, having just seen it, it's, it's re repeated a few times, but it's like an overhead kind of zoom, or not zoom, a tracking shot from the overhead. Mm -hmm. In like, it's like, kind of like it's scanning a space, and I was, that just mm -hmm. stuck with me, and I'm curious why that comes up a few times. Well, uh, working with the cinematographer, uh, Yalo Faber, he, we, we, this is what I normally like to do, we try and work out some set of rules. Mm -hmm obviously we can break them if we want to and one of the rules where we were gonna at certain points in the movie use the overhead shot mm. uh, and I think part of my inspiration for that was that these are divers working at the bottom of the sea and the perspective upon that is looking down at, you know looking from above down it's also the, within the hierarchy uh, because it depicts a hierarchy mm. a social hierarchy uh, and the divers are at the bottom of that hierarchy. So that, that were the, that's, that's the, the, the main inspiration for, for those overhead shots. Mm. 
and, and working with the cinematographer underwater especially like there there's the shots are so composed but I feel like when you're shooting underwater it must be so difficult to mm. to have that level of control we look through uh, a lot of underwater films okay. uh, uh, just to get a sense of what what what, what was going to be the main challenges mm -hmm. Uh, at the same time, we did research with the original pioneer divers, and they would tell me like uh, that on a good day, because it's weather dependent down there as well. Uh, you could see clear, you could see very very far in dark water, and that's what it's like to be at the bottom. And that inspired me a lot, actually. That was like sort of an image which stuck with me, but. Once we started working on how to achieve this, it became the main challenge of making the movie. Mm. Uh, because if you, it's just like if you pour a little bit of milk into a pool, it will instantly go a little, little muddy. You, you, you lose clarity. Mm. And that's what you find in most movies which are shot uh, underwater movies, you know. Mm. Uh, so we researched it. We thought about doing it like sort of dry for wet. Didn't want to do that because I'd, felt it wasn't going to be organic enough and we were going to lose con economic control. So eventually there was a Finnish diving film team who, who researched it and came back with a uh, lake in, on Iceland which has the clearest water they could find. Mm -hmm. And the basics for that was that uh, it's, it's water from a glacier which has been filtered by lava sand for like uh, 30 kilometers and it comes out in a sort of like a crevice mm. and it and and they could more or less guarantee uh, clear water oh okay uh, and then we shot it at night um, so so that was that's where we shot the the, the wide shots mm. uh, took, and um, our, our main inspiration for doing so you know the visual inspiration wasn't there's the abyss, which is the one movie which actually achieves this, you know, but it's the most expensive movie you can think of, uh, which my producers kept reminding me, and <laughs> fair enough. Um, but we were also looking at science fiction movies, because they have this infinite depth, uh, which you get in, mm. in, in, in space. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we were looking at that, and those were sort of some of the visual references. Mm. And it's got an interesting color palette. I think with all of your films, I associate like a color palette with each one. Mm -hmm. It sticks in my mind. And mm -hmm. it seems like the, this one has two distinct ones that are playing off one another, the underwater and then the kind of above ground uh, mm -hmm. warmth. How did you settle upon those, those schemes? Um, it's true about the color palette because I, I actually think it's, it, it's, it's equally important to decide what's not because yeah. you're shooting in you're shooting normally film on location in, in reality, at least that's what we do in Scandinavia. We don't have the budget to, to do it otherwise. Um, so we, you have to try and exclude colors, you know, and, 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 uh, and also I kind of, I always want, this is uh, something I always want the movies I direct to feel physical, uh, that you have a physical experience of watching the movie, mm. that it takes you somewhere. Like, and I wanted them, I wanted the audience really to get a feeling that you're going down three, four hundred meters under the surface. Mm. Uh, down there, it's, the color, there, there isn't that strong color. Uh, uh, so, so, so the color will, you, you can get the glimpse of sort of strong color, but, but the color palette there is, we actually sort of thought that the ocean was not going to have this blue tint, mm. which you normally associate with with underwater movies, we, we wanted the black feel of the ocean. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the backdrop for it. Mm. Whereas up on land, we were looking at sort of like a greenish feel to the, uh, to the image, mm. uh, which I can't really, I, I think that's more in, instinctual and, and, and it, it was the cinematographer's ID mm. uh, this and, and he came with it and he had a color palette which which I thought was really interesting. Mm. And, and what are the implications of having a conspiracy story but also a historical story? Is, is there any backlash uh, or is it something that is generally agreed upon within the nation about what happened or is this kind of ruffling some feathers? 
there is a there is a there's been court cases mm. our story depicts what happened at the point when we had discovered oil but deep down in the nordic sea and we didn't know exactly how to get it ashore mm -hmm. uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, well, especially the oil industry, the international oil industry, mm -hmm. were sort of attracted to this, which they are wherever you find oil. Um, and there was a power struggle going on, who would be able to secure it mm -hmm. and how. That's where the divers came in, because no one had worked at such depth before. Uh, so it was, it was needed to prove that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And then they set up these experiments, which all, all of this is true. Mm -hmm. In, in partly in simulated environments and partly out in the North Sea to see how far down can you go. The main challenge is not just physically going there, it, it's that the air we breathe turns to poison inside your, your lungs. So you have to experiment and find the right gas which makes it possible to function at such depths. Um, and later on uh, it's an acknowledged and proven that these divers got uh, effects, uh, turned ill, had neurological damage uh, from these experiments and later working down there. Mm. Um, and, but they've lost all court cases against the Norwegian government. And mm. They've now taken it to the Strasbourg court, which is sort of human rights court. Mm. That backdrop is, 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 is known, but the details on how, it, on how and what took place yeah. is quite complex and, and we researched it thoroughly, but eventually we decided we were going to use real events, but create it into sort of a, a fictional uh, story to dramatize mm. it. And because some of those court cases are still happening, are you hoping that this maybe is going to draw a little more attention to the matter? Um, well, both yes and no, because I think the court cases can sometimes uh, uh, give you an idea that this, this is all about um, uh, an homage to the divers. But, but to me, it, it's a bit more complex than that, because it's what actually took place. Norway is now one of the richest countries on, on earth, mm -hmm. and, and the way we secured our oil, and, and it wasn't privatized and owned by sort of international companies is, is uh, a benefit to the whole nation and my generation and generations after uh, are, are benefiting from it, you know. So, so I feel like ambiguous about uh, what took place and, 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 and who sacrificed what. And that, that's more or less what my angle on, on, on the story. I felt like I was going to investigate this. But m basically, thinking, okay, what was the attitude at that point, mm. not now. And it's interesting you mentioned that because all of your films have a kind of skepticism towards institutions or like uh, acknowledge that there are flaws that exist within them. And, and sometimes it can kind of work out like with Nokas, but even still you lose some money. Like there's always, there's that ambiguity that you're mentioning. Mm. And is that something that you're aware of when you're approaching these, like that, that's a recurring theme? I think, I don't look upon human beings, nor do I look upon organizations as entirely bad or totally sort of good. There's, it's always somewhere in between. You have good intentions which may not turn right, there's cynicism, there's all these elements. But uh, uh, to me, that, that reflects the world uh, we live in. And, and, and so, yes, I am skeptical of, of, of of big uh, organizations or corporations and, and, and I think power corrupts and stuff but um, but um, but I also think sometimes we benefit from them. What was the production like of this film uh, versus Nokas because they're both films where you're recreating events in, in as much oh yeah no Nokas was a film which we which we shot for, um, well, in, in US dollars, it would be like four million maybe. Oh, yeah. Whereas this is more like seven or eight, I think. And, and so it, it was twice the budget. And part of that was, or the mo part of that was the underwater mm -hmm. elements. But also it was a period we were going much further back in time and that's 
that, that, that is challenging in of itself. You know? mm. And we were doing sort of industrial sets, which we couldn't find anymore. Uh, so we had to build them. Mm. And Nuka seems to have like a more like a rigid form. Like it has to happen between this hour and this hour. It's almost in real time. Nokas is a reenactment yeah, yeah. of everything that happened at the biggest robbery in Norwegian history. And we set out a premise at that point to say, well, we're not going to fictionalize anything. Mm. We're just going to try and figure out, because a lot of people claim, there were claims and counterclaims, and we were going to try and figure out through speaking to everyone involved mm. who wanted to speak with us, uh, and try and figure out what, what, well, what, what really took place and how did small things influence others. Um, it, it, it was kind of like an experimental approach f f on my behalf anyway, and, uh, but it's still a, a film I'm, I'm very happy about. Um, but, but Pioneer is somewhat more traditional in its approach mm. to, to, to how you approach a, um, research and create a fictional story out of it. Mm fictional elements out of true stories. It's also interesting that Pioneer is farther back, so some audiences may not really know what's happening, whereas with Nokus, everyone kind of knows exactly what's going to happen by the end because it's so recent, right? Mm. Is that something that was like liberating or was it more of a challenge? No, I did look at Greengrass movie but before I did okay, uh, yeah. Nokus, the, the one about United 93. Mm. And the one thing which struck me above ev everything else was how tense it felt, mm -hmm. even though I knew exactly what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it was also because Nokas had been so heavily publicized in Norway and, and it, it had been tabloid, uh, tabloid sort of headlines for such a long period that I felt like it, was all, it, it had turned fic into fiction mm -hmm. in of itself, you know, or, or, or or imagination of what, how that robbery took place mm. had become fictitious. So I wanted to try and reverse that mm. by making a fiction which actually feels more real. Mm. Um, whereas Pioneer is more of an epic uh, story because it's the most important turning point in my nation's uh, modern history. Mm. It, it, it's, it's the point when we, how we managed to secure oil and gas resources, which has made us one of the richest countries on Earth. Was it near the end of NOCUS where I think there was actual footage used? Was there any actual footage used in NOCUS or was it all recreated? No, there were actual yes. footage used uh, towards the end. And if you were to go and look at the original fo footage, I was being obsessional about even cars passing needed to have the same color, same rhythm to how things... Mm. It's, it, I mean, the surveillance cameras weren't went great, you know, they, it had all broken down. But, but, but I looked through whatever was mm. to try and recapture the feeling of exactly how it took place. Yeah, it's interesting that the Pioneer starts with that footage and Nokus kind of ended with it. And it even made me think of Enemy of the People that starts with a shot of a television. Like, mm. uh, what does that mean to you to have kind of using that either real footage or footage that's being watched on TV as like the opening to a film? It's a very kind of meta or I think um, the layers I think I think a modern audience is quite sophisticated in uh, when it comes to sort of um, um, uh, when it comes to interpreting uh, facts and fiction mm. and I think part of our modern culture is actually drawn to it you know the 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 line which separates mm. facts from fiction uh, which I think is, is somehow what feeds our culture mm. to, to a large extent. Uh, whereas like if you go 40 years back or whatever, it was the great novels, you know, it, it was like fictionalized stories which were sort of giving us a metaphor and a, 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 in a, some kind of interpretation of, mm. of, of what life was like. Now it's moved very now the, the culture has moved very close, you know, like sort of fiction and facts is, is intertwined. In, 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 and and I've, I find that very interesting and, and that's partly why, why I'm so inspired by real events. And, and, and when you were describing the court cases, I, I did think of uh, Enemy of the People. It kind of seems like a similar experience where 
people didn't the public, general public didn't know the effects of something and mm. now that it's being kind of uh, shown to them they're still not getting that it seems like it's almost predicting what happens in mm. pioneer mm. is that is that a theme that you're drawn to the the way that the public interacts with um, governing bodies i guess or or th- uh, whistleblowers or no i'm drawn to truth and how you how truth can sort of pursue you and in the end you know if you if you if you're if you're pursuing truth in the end truth can somewhat corrupt you yeah. <laughs> because truth is not an, an entity which can which can be cleanly uh, destillated you know it it it, it feel, always feels like something when you think you got the truth it somehow disappears between your fingers mm. always uh, and and that is and, and what it does to a character like in Pioneer, and, and one of my main inspirations were that the truth he was pursuing mm. so vigorously, you know, throughout the story, is also uh, a truth which is something he gradually discovers he doesn't want because it actually sort of says something about how his nervous system is in fact mm. infected, you know. Um, so I guess that is a theme somewhat. Yeah, it made me think of insomnia, the, like the fact that if you were to, uh, if, if everyone were to know how the, the case was happening, they would know that he mm. committed a crime during it. Like, mm-hmm. It seems like these films, it seems like insomnia was so long ago and that Prozac Nation kind of divides your films after. Mm. Like they seem like they're more of a piece than, mm. than insomnia and Prozac Nation. Was there something that you developed after Prozac Nation? Uh, maybe the experience? Uh, I think I think Prozac Nation was probably the exception because I was pursuing insomnia gave me a lot of attention in the American market, yeah. like sort of uh, um, it, it was remade by uh, you know a, a huge remake and even before then I attracted some quite a bit of attention yeah. in, in Hollywood, um, but and then I was trying to to make a project which which I've been working on for a while and I found that people weren't this was a different project and found that people weren't willing to invest unless you had an A star actor I think this is something most filmmakers get involved with and chasing A star actors felt like sort of um, like being in a plane sort of sitting in a, in, in a corridor trying not knowing whether you're gonna land or not so so eventually I, I, I got impatient and, and, and went on to a different project, which was Prozac Nation, mm. which I was offered. Um, insomnia is a different thing, because Insomnia, I feel, it's my, it's my first film, I sort of work on, on instinct more than anything when, when, when you do your first feature, I think. Or of course, I learned a lot from film school, but, but the approach to Insomnia is quite close to the approach in Pioneer. Mm, yeah given that it's a story told exclusively from a subjective point of view. Mm. Yeah, and it allows you to have more of those kind of experimental flourishes. I found that some of the subjective mm. kind of, not just the actual kind of hallucinations, but the filters that are used or the different lenses reminded me of what the very start of Insomnia, which is maybe the most experimental moment I've noticed in your work. Mm. Do you feel the luxury of being able to play around with the form a bit more with a story like this, or is it just yeah, I like doing genre films. I'm, I'm kind of inspired. I think it's from my youth. I'm sort of inspired by genre. Yeah. But I, I but, but, but formula in of itself, I find boring. So, so I always want to try and expand it from within. You know, uh, and then, I, and then I, I look. F- I'm interested in form, and I think form can sort of influence content. You know, to a large extent. So, in, in terms of film, so, so I'm. So that's why I think this type of subjective approach is interesting to me because it allows me to experiment uh, with, with form, yeah. Mm. And do you have a project lined up after this? Or you... Yes, I, I do have a project about, this is also a true story, it's about a pyromaniac which was son of the, uh, of the head of the fire brigade. Oh. Uh, so his project was that he was uh, setting fire to two places and then he was rushing home in order to reach his father when the alarm went and this was just kind of like a, a small town 
in order to get out there first and 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 then um, get the acclaim for uh, for turning uh, well as as you know as the hero we know as mm -hmm. fireman. Uh, and this is this is a story. It's based on a book um, by Goethe Hebel, which I think is going to be published in America at least. Um, but that's the film I want to do, and. I've learned through the years that you know it depends on whether getting things financed. Yeah. And we're, we're working on the script, mm -hmm. and hopefully, we'll, hopefully, we'll get it financed, and I'll be shooting it, well, next year maybe. Hmm. Are you attracted to the the small town narrative? Like that seems like something that was really interesting in Enemy of the People, like that element of it. Yeah, I'm from a quite a small small town, you know, and and and, and a community like that. It's, it it interests me, but but it's also a good arena. For, uh, because because you need an arena to create a universe, I mm. think, and, and that that's very important for a film. Mm. Uh, so that, that might be another reason. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was hard getting um, um, the Ibsen. The Ibsen one. Yeah. The Ibsen one was never. Um, it never traveled. Yeah, I felt like it was like it was ahead of its time like it kind of uh -huh. picked out social uh -huh. things that were gonna get worse and worse or have become worse and worse since then but I guess Ibsen was ahead of the game too he was he was a hundred years ahead <laughs> in that respect Nocus was a little easier to get get a hold of here well, that's another story it's that was huge well I can tell you about yeah. it uh, when, when we're, but that was, it was usually successful uh, in the home market yeah and in France, it was quite successful, but it never traveled to the States. Mm. And uh, I think they found it. We had some screening at a festival in New York. Mm. Uh, and I think mm, the, the immediate reaction was well, how can police behave like that? Type of <laughs> the, the naivety of it. In yeah, yeah, yeah. 